Hi everybody, it's Chris, and welcome to another video by the Infinity System. Uh, have you ever felt like this? Well, I got a couple of thousand goddamn questions, you know? I want to speak to someone in charge. I want a lodge a complaint. What the hell is going on around here? Who the hell are you people? I think we all have. Which brings us to the topic of today's episode, which is, who in the hell are you people? Alters, and all about them. So first off, we want to start off with the obvious question. What is an alter? So the first thing we need to understand is called the theory of structural dissociation. Basically, this states that we are not born with an integrated personality, but instead with a collection of ego states, which are basically basic feelings, basic emotions attachments to your caregiver, feeding, I'm being fed, uh, this is mommy, exploration, oh, what is this weird world around me, let's check it out. And eventually these develop over the course of time into one coherent personality or identity. This usually happens between the ages of six to nine, obviously it varies for everyone, uh, but this is where our personality comes from, this is where, where the neurotypical folks this is where their personality congeals and they become them. There is no separations. In DID and other dissociative conditions, trauma disrupts this integration of ego states to form into one personality. The trauma can be wartime activity, having to survive a bombing or something like that, the obvious sexual assault, physical abuse, emotional abuse, deprivation of basic needs, just absolute neglect. This trauma disrupts the natural connections in the brain. The brain, realizing that the personality cannot deal with it, decides to file it away for another time, so it takes all of the sights and the sounds and the smells. That entire instant or experience and it records it onto your brain. Everything. It's all still there. The trouble is, is the section on, sectioning off of these memories disrupts the integration of the ego states. Now this leads us to, in disassociative conditions, to two different types of alters or ego states, if you will. There are ANPs, which stands for apparently normal part, which is a rational, logical part that's responsible for functioning in the outside world. For example, going to work or interacting uh, at the grocery store, things of that nature, the nitty gritty of life. So ANPs are apparently normal parts. They function in the outside world. They do not hold the trauma because they can't function that way by hanging on to it. The trauma is sectioned and encapsulated in the emotional part. You remember those recordings that we were just talking about? That's an EP, or emotional part. They contain all of the trauma, they contain all of those bad memories, that whole experience, and the ANPs will do their best to avoid the EPs, if at all possible, without even realizing that they're doing it. Case in point, uh, in our diagnosis story, we told you about how our initial therapist uh, referred us to a trauma specialist, and we avoided her for three months. Uh, she was very patient and kept calling us and saying, you know, please call me, and well, it was very, very patient, And but we just, we didn't want to call her back. For whatever reason, we just did, just avoided it like the plague. Finally, one day, we got to arguing with ourselves, uh, although we didn't know we were ourselves at that point, and we finally called her back. Uh, so that is a real-life example right there of the ANP parts doing their level-headed best to avoid the EP parts that are holding onto the trauma, even though they don't know it's there. They still... it's like there's something wrong and they feel it, so they avoid it. Okay, so we've pretty much explained what EAPs are already but let's just review it again. EPs, or emotional parts, are those alters who contain that recording of the trauma, including all of the sensory information experienced during the time. Sight, sound, smell, touch, taste. You get the idea. 
So what determines disassociation? What determines somebody versus PTSD versus full-blown DIT? There are actually names for these different levels. The first, which is basically PTSD, you have the division into an ANP and an EP. One ANP, one EP. This is called primary structural dissociation, where you only have one of each part, PTSD. The next step up in severity would be secondary structural dissociation, which is where you have one ANP and numerous EPs. This occurs in CPTSD, uh, OSDD, and BPD. Those are all secondary structural dissociations, one ANP and many EPs. That brings us to tertiary structural dissociation. This is where the trauma is so severe that you have numerous AMPs and numerous EPs simultaneously. This is DID, or Dissociative Identity Disorder. Now, of course, we have all these AMPs and we have all of these EPs. Let's just call them alters from this point out. So, your types of alters. First off, you have your hosts. Uh, although you could argue that cores come first, but we'll get into that in a sec. Your hosts are the ANPs, or the alters, that are most commonly in charge of, of fronting in the body. They take care of the day-to-day. -day. Uh, they may have various jobs, like for us, we have Bootstraps, who deals with the Mr. Fix-It, Do-It-Yourself, Home Handyman, house repairs and things like that, or whenever any hard labor needs to get done. We have Data, who deals with things like the taxes and, you know, mental things that the rest of us just aren't that good at. Uh, then you have me, uh, the host, and also possibly the core, who kind of, I think I kind of act as like a a mediator at, a, at, at like a federation, if you're into Star Trek, like a federation council of worlds. That's kind of like what I do, because I'm the one in the middle, and everybody's got their own opinions and thoughts, and boy, sometimes it can get really busy upstairs. Um, so, hosts, we're the ones who are out the most. That brings us to cores, in that case, me. The core is the original, if you will, personality state, or the one that was most likely to have formed before the trauma. When you have DID and you have numerous ANPs, uh, how do you determine which one was the original? Uh, in my case, or our case, we're not entirely sure. Our therapist says that, yeah, we're the core, but I don't know, that kind of doesn't jibe with some of what we get on the inside, but who knows, because this whole thing is a confusing, frustrating journey where the only constant is that there is no constant. <sighs> Sorry, frustration. And center and mindful, and we're moving on. Okay, that brings us to gatekeepers, which is... A gatekeeper would be data in our system. They're the people who are responsible for controlling which altar is going to be upfront for which particular purpose. So when the plumbing starts spurting all over the place, data's the one who taps bootstraps on the shoulder and go, yeah, uh, bro, you got a problem that you got to take care of. And bootstraps is, oh God, not again. Then goes and takes care of it. So that's a gatekeeper. Alters obviously can have different functions and different roles, and they can serve more than one function, as we'll see. So those are gatekeepers. As the core, I also kind of act as a gatekeeper, so we do it together. Uh, but like I said before, Data and I are very co-blended. Um, there's not a whole heck of a lot of difference. Yeah, so, okay, so gatekeepers, that brings us to protectors. Protector's primary job is exactly what it's it's there in the name. They protect. They protect the system. Commonly, they protect the littles in the system, or the more vulnerable EPs. Protectors are commonly ANPs, but they can also be EPs. In our case, our primary protector for our little ones, and all, well, also for the older ones as well, is Rosemarie, who you guys have not yet met. Uh, she's thinking about coming on camera, but, you know, it's, it's, she's basically 50s housewife, and her, 
by choice. And her world is, you know, it's like she's she's like, you know, nobody's going to be interested in watching me clean, you know, and, and or cook or anything like that. And I'm and we're patiently trying to explain to her, Rosemary, people love that kind of stuff. They would adore you, and you know, she's just like, yeah, whatever. She, she's very reticent. Anyway, but she keeps an eye on the littles mostly. But when we do get really in distress and spun out, and we've fallen down the rabbit hole, and are having a tough time regrounding to the present, she has stepped in and comforted us uh, as a whole. So it's a little weird and brain bendy, but that's her job. Um, but there are other types of protectors, for example, uh, physical or aggressive protectors. When we are out in the world, bootstraps is the one that can step in and get pretty aggressive sometimes, and we've had to keep a close lock on that, and we have come close a couple times to, you know, getting into altercations in the Walmart parking lot, things like that, where, you know, Bootstraps loses his temper, and the rest of us are there screaming, no, you know, so, uh, again, a protector. Mimi is our protector as well. Uh, she's more interested in, you know, keeping people at bay. It's, it's that, you know, whole, you know, I'm tough, so I'm not going to get hurt. Okay. Sorry, she's yelling at me right now. <laughs> um, so, shh, don't reveal secrets. Um, so, again, protectors. Persecutors. We just saw that happen. A persecutor is somebody who is... <sighs> Some people like to term them the negative alters or the evil alters because they can act out in self-destructive ways, but what they're actually doing is trying to protect the system in the only way that they know how which is to exhibit negative behavior that pushing people away, you know, I'll, if, if I'm, if I never get close to anybody, I'll never get hurt. You know, don't trust that person because they're just going to let us down. They're going to turn on us. They're going to stab us in the back, just like everybody else in our life has done. We're just going to end up more miserable than anything else. So let's just, you know, keep away to ourselves, shove them away. Or for example, oh my God, I look as fat as a cow. Oh, Jesus, what the hell have I let myself become? I look like crap. You know, it's like, uh, I'm eating too much or I'm so thin. God, I'm not bulky enough. I mean, look at this. This is like, you know, where's my Popeye arms? We look like a skinny 98 pound weakling on the beach getting sand kicked into our face. The constantly running negative dialogue in the back of your mind that you may not even realize is there. Those are the persecutors. And it's not that they're deliberately trying to drag you down, it's just they're they're expressing themselves, their dissatisfaction in the only way that they know how. At its most extreme, this can lead to self-harm behaviors, cutting, drinking, drug abuse, risky sexual behaviors. Um, it's really important to learn to work with and accept your persecutors. And, okay, and don't get us wrong. We are only a year into this, so we have not, have not figured all of this out, okay? So any of you out there who are thinking, oh my god, they're so together, they've got it all figured out, please, uh-uh, <laughs> don't. <laughs> don't even, because we haven't. We're just giving you our perspective and what we've learned. So your mileage may vary. So, we've covered persecutors. It's important to work with them, to make them feel that they have a voice and that they're accepted. And if you find that you do, and most of the time they just want to be heard, uh, they're very fearful. Uh, they, they contain a lot of fear, and a lot of persecutors are often EPs. Uh, they're the ones that can be ANPs and EPs, because Mimi, for example, she is an EP and an ANP. So, protectors, persecutors, that brings us to littles. Littles are the EPs that hold the worst of the trauma, those memories that were encapsulated in early abuse, no matter what it was, or intense trauma. They are the most vulnerable parts of any system. Most littles are time-locked. Because of the way that the memory of the trauma is encoded on the brain, all of the perceptions are all there. The, their entire world is that memory, or 
the space of time surrounding that memory. This is why, for example, Mimi is still stuck in 1984. She is aware that she's in the... but it sets up the cognitive disconnect between this time period and that one. Her brain, it's still 84, you know, and, and if she tries to bridge that gap, it's it starts to set up a feedback loop. Um, so she just kind of goes... <laughs> uh, so, littles. Um, very precious, injured things that deserved better. Deserved a lot better. That brings us to fronting. How do you know who's in control of the body at any one point in time? And how exactly the hell does that work anyway? To a person with DID, the body is just a shell. Uh, it's... Okay, if you're into, like, uh, giant robots or Pacific Rim, think of the body as a mech, okay? It's a great, big, powerful robot that an alter can step in to the cockpit and grab hold of the controls. Yes, I know this is similar to the car metaphor, but personally it's overused and we don't like it, so we're using a giant robot, by God. <laughs> right. So, you're in the mech, and you're piloting. What if somebody else wants to pilot at the same time? That's called co-blending. Now, what happens if you get more than one alter who wants to take hold of the controls and they're working in odd, at odds with each other? They're fighting with each other. I want to go to the store. Well, I want to go to the restaurant. Well, I want to go to the library and read a book. Well, I want to browse the thrift shops. You know, I want to go antiquing. I want to do this. I want to stay at home and read a book. I want to go hide in the closet and shut myself away from the world because Sweater Town is not accepting incoming calls. How do you deal with that? Uh, it takes a lot of time and a lot of cooperation. And for us, at any rate, the first part is identifying who the hell does what. We've been working together for so long without realizing it that a large part of our task is separating okay, you do this, you do this, where do you end, where does this begin? A lot of us will co-conscious, naturally anyway, Data and I, um, Bootstraps, Mimi, Rosemary, the Major, Nigel, Percival, all the Major Alts will more or less cooperate and co-blend easily, uh, but it can lead to discourse. Uh, so this leads us, or I'm sorry, to disagreement. This leads us to switching. Okay, switching is the act of one alter either stepping forward or stepping back to drive the mech. There are several different ways or types of switching. There is smooth switching, which is where the alters basically work together to make a smooth handoff or a smooth transition rather than just an abrupt boom, I'm out. That's a smooth switch. It's much easier on the body and on everyone involved because the act of switching will cause vascular pressure to change in the brain. This is why often when you switch, if you have DID, you will get the worst damn headaches you've ever had in your life. These actually have a special name. They're called T-I-T-H, Transitional Interpersonality Thunderclap headaches. Uh, information in the description below. Yes, they actually have a name. And for those of you who have never had one of these bad boys, imagine the worst migraine that you've ever had and amplify it by like 10,000. Uh, it's excruciating. During the worst of these, I would gladly pay someone to smother me just to put me out of my misery. Um, not really, obviously, but they're, they're rough. Smooth switching minimizes that. The cooperation minimizes the vascular pressure. You're going to get it anyway, but by not hard switching, which is where I'm done, I'm out. It's like opening and slamming a door without any notice. This causes a very abrupt pressure change and is almost guaranteed to give you a TITH. The last one is forced switching. Uh, this is where, <sighs> I hate to think that 
people around a system would be so callous and not understanding as to deliberately try to provoke or bring out a deliberate altar that they want to deal with against the altar's will. DID systems can be triggered to forcibly switch uh, by reactivating the trauma or reactivating a trigger that leads to the trauma. We'll deal with triggers later on, but essentially triggers are those things that correspond or remind your brain of the original trauma incident. A sight, a sound, a smell, a taste, and they're random. You never know what the hell they're going to be. Uh, we were triggered out one day when we were fixing green beans, for God's sakes, uh, which led to a nasty flashback. Uh, but, you know, just green beans, and, you know... <laughs> just fixing dinner in the kitchen, and all of a sudden we're in the middle of a flashback because of the damn green beans. That was an accident, but knowing those triggers of a system, you can then trigger them. Uh, this is just... Okay, it's just... Uh, no, I'm not actually saying it, just because I know that we do have littles and others who watch this show, and I really, I don't really want to be terribly profane, but yeah, it's messed. Don't do it. Don't do it, because you're just re-traumatizing the DID system and the altars involved. You're causing damage. They'll come out if they want to come out, and that's all there is to it. So all of this, you know, oh, I'm going to force it out, or I'm going to force one of, you know, even the systems will do it. I'm going to force somebody to come to the front out of spite. Say you're having a disagreement with one of the altars on the inside, and you're currently fronting. Well, you can just simply decide to turn over that controls to them. Or drag them into the front. Uh, we've had that happen. Not sure if that's unique to us, but we have had it happen. So, smooth, hard, forced. So that brings us to blending and co-consciousness, which we've already kind of covered, but it's worth revisiting. Co-consciousness is where one or more altars are co-conscious with the ANPs and the other EPs. Uh, they're there. They're riding along. They're watching from the background and kind of hanging out vicariously, as it will. That's co-consciousness, and at that point, whoever's co-con can take over the front. Um, it's a lot easier to do it that way, and particularly if you want to get something done, like the background for Percival's Little's Corner, or, sorry, Little Stories, uh, we all cooperated on it, and it, and it was an interesting exercise for us because it required us to be co-conscious and to work together. Uh, it did take a toll on us physically, but it was an interesting learning experience, and it was therapeutic. We learned to work together better as a result of it for a common goal. A good thing, in capital letters. So, that's co-conscious, but what about non-co-conscious alters? These are the scary parts. These are the altars that come out, and the rest of you have no idea who they are, what they've been doing. Uh, <laughs> it's scary, because you can wake up and you find yourself in a place that you don't remember getting to. You don't know where the hell you are. You don't know how you got there. You may be wearing different clothes. Um, fortunately, we really haven't been plagued by any of those severe, but we have had time gaps of up to 24 hours uh, on the average nine, at least three and generally nine uh, throughout the courses of our life we just kind of never paid much attention to them when we were growing up but now it's like <laughs> wonder who that was uh, and frankly I we find the idea of non-co really frightening really scary because if there and we have had indications that there is at least one non-co call alter in our system so yeah non-co scary real scary because it's a loss of control you don't know when it's going to happen if it's going to happen if you're going to wake up in your bed or not or a little freaky a little freaky now this leads us to kind of interesting territory and again, this just might be specific to our system, but we felt that it bore mentioning. And that's basically, our some of our alters, Mimi in particular, have the ability to memory block their time when they front. 
in other words, let's see if I can describe this. Mimi originally came out Halloween night of last year to spend time with girls. It was her first time fronting. Really, totally fronting in the body since the initial traumas. At the time, even though she was up front, Data and I were co-blended in the back, but we had willingly agreed to more or less turn over the reins. So, we were co-con for that time. But here's the thing. After she switched back out and we resumed the front, those memories of her time fronting began to leach away. And we are not able to remember what all was said and done on Halloween when she was fronting. We have vague memories. Of, I mean, we know we watched Halloween the movie. We know we were talking with the girls. But if you asked us what was discussed and the details of the conversation, we would not be able to tell you. Because Mimi has taken and walled those memories off. Those are her memories. And she's at her time, and she's very protective of that. And that's, that's she's done that to us several times. And we, as a system, though, it, it, it eats at us a little. We have to accept that that is her time and work with her on that. So, again, something weird that we've noticed. We don't know if any of you guys have experienced the same thing. If you have, please hit us up in the comment section for sure. Basically... That's all for the episode, but just to throw us down the rabbit hole just a little bit more, let's talk about Alterception. Alterception is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's alts within alts. This is actually possible within some systems that have split most multiple times. You literally will have EPs, uh, emotional parts who have sustained prolonged trauma. Enough to where they've been out long enough, they have fronted long enough through the course of the trauma that they have actually developed an alt as a result, their own EP as a result of the prolonged trauma. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so this starts to get you thinking, okay, we've got alts within alts, so you can literally have a system within a system. Uh, so, alterception, spinning tops, anyone? And this leads to a really uncomfortable thought, at least for us. We call this the core host conundrum. And basically it boils down to this. Am I the host? Am I the core? Or am I an alter? Am I an ANP? Am I an EP? Am I actually me? Or is the real host or the real core going to surface later? And I've just simply been acting as host for them in the meantime. We don't know. Haven't got the foggiest. So, Alterception and the core host conundrum. Just some of the wonderful uncertainties that we ANPs and EPs live with in a DID system. So, we would really like to know your guys' thoughts on today's episode. Hit us up in the comment section below. Let us know what you think. Let us know if we completely lost you with all of this. We tried to boil it down to the essence and give you both the, the actual facts and the research and our personal experience with it to help, you know, kind of give some perspective, but uh, hit us up with your thoughts. Let us know how your system has dealt with some of these issues and uh, what types of alters you have and what do you think of the, the theory of structural disassociation? Do you agree about the AMPs and the EPs? Uh, let us know your thoughts. Uh, as always, we thank you for watching. If you haven't, be sure to click like, share, and subscribe below. We are also now on social media, so check out the links below for our Instagram and Twitter feeds, as well as Facebook, if anybody actually still uses that anymore. Uh, so hit us up down there if you want to say anything or see what we're up to. We're not really savvy, but hey, we're trying. So remember, you are loved, you're strong, and you're not alone. I'm Chris. Thanks for watching.